J.K. Rowling confirms popular fan theory about Hermione Granger. No way. J.K. Rowling included that passage on how to pronounce Hermione's name in Goblet of Fire just to school all of us who were saying her my own like Victor Crumb. That that was the theory. J.K. Rowling confirms disturbing Harry Potter theory. Well, this one's got to be better, right? Dumbledore is deaf. It's a beautiful theory and it fits. That's your favourite fan theory. No, this video isn't actually going to be about JK Rowling's Twitter, surprisingly enough. Last week was interesting and all, but it's nothing new anymore. No, instead this week I'm going to be talking about a little known something called metaphorical theories. One of the worst types of theories in my opinion. Because for some reason making meta videos critiquing a specific type of theory is something I do now. Anyway, I can say as almost a certainty that anyone who has an interest in or at least has got stuck down a rabbit hole of theories on the internet has come across a metaphorical theory before. You may not even be aware of it, but I guarantee you have. The main structure of one of these is that something happens in the story being theorized about that symbolizes something else, and then the theory is that it was the creator's intention for it to symbolize that thing? Okay, that probably made no sense, so let me give you an example. I don't know, uh, Dumbledore is deaf. J.K. Rowling's favourite Harry Potter theory. If you don't know it, let me quickly summarise. The theory states that Voldemort is similar to the eldest of the three brothers because they were both power hungry and wanted to conquer death. Two very rare traits for people to have. You know, I personally have never met a power hungry person who fears death before. Then you have Snape, who similarly to the middle brother was in love with someone who died too soon, you know, another very rare quality that no one else has. And then the youngest brother is similar to Harry because, well, they both own the invisibility cloak at some point and were related, I don't know. Which therefore metaphorically makes Dumbledore deaf because he played a part in both Snape and Voldemort's deaths and Harry greeted him like an old friend at King's Cross. Making the Deathly Hallows a metaphor for the tale of the three brothers. That's it. That's the theory. Voldemort, Snape, Harry and Dumbledore's stories kind of mirror the tale of the three brothers a little. I guess it's kind of cool if this was intentional symbolism and foreshadowing from JK Rowling, which it isn't because she describes it as a beautiful theory and it fits not a beautiful fact that was always originally intended to be noticed by the reader when I was writing the book. And at the end of the day, all it is, is kinda cool. Don't tell me this is anything more than kinda cool because it just isn't. It doesn't change the way you view the series. Oh wow, so Dumbledore maybe metaphorically symbolizes death. Doesn't that just change everything? Like, I don't even know if I wanna call theories like this theories because they're not theories, they're literally just metaphors. By definition, a theory is a supposition or system of ideas intended to explain something, especially one based on general principles independent of the thing to be explained. The key bit there is intended to explain something. Please tell me what this Dumbledore is deaf metaphor explains. That the tale of the three brothers symbolizes the Deathly Hallows because that's a question no one ever had. There is no reason this would ever be used to explain something which is different to a theory because, well, that's their entire purpose. Take theories like who is Snoke or where did Elsa get her powers from or where were Boo's parents during Monsters Inc. All attempt to answer questions that either needed answering or at least could be answered. And whether the theory aligns with the creator's original intention or not, it gets people thinking and can definitely make them view the film differently. Some would even describe these theories as mind-blowing. Meanwhile, metaphors, in my opinion, don't really blow your mind. I more or less leave you asking the question, why? What was the point of that information? How on earth is this JK Rowling's favourite theory about her story? I understand when you answered this question you didn't want to say any correct theories in case you want to delve into them in future stories, like if you revealed that Nagini was actually a woman was your favourite theory back in 2015, that would have ruined the big reveal in Fantastic Beasts The Crimes of Grindelwald. Trailer. Yeah, that was revealed in a trailer, premiered on Twitter, not that it matters. But like, you could have at least chosen a theory that would have changed an aspect of your story. Like, an example I can think of off the top of my head is the theory that Crookshanks is actually the Potter's cat. That confirmation would add so many layers to Crookshanks quite 
single layered character. Oh, so that's why Crookshanks hates Scabbers so much. That makes so much more sense. Like, that's a significantly better theory. It's actually a theory. <laughs> However, I guess at the end of the day, that's just in my opinion. I honestly feel like I'm the only person who finds these metaphorical theories uninteresting. Because I see them on top 10 theories lists everywhere. You know, despite my efforts to never view a top 10 theories list again, sometimes they're just too funny to ignore. And I found this 20 Pixar movie theories that make a surprising amount of sense list by the Ranker.com. And literally three of the theories are metaphors. Firstly, we've got we're watching Carl's journey to Ellie in the afterlife. And basically the theory is that Carl dies at the start and the whole film is just a metaphor for him reaching the afterlife or South America. Really makes sense and holds the test of time, that one. Secondly, we've got Nemo is a figment of Marlin's imagination, which really similarly is based off someone dying, in this case Nemo, at the start off screen. And then the whole film is about Marlin learning to deal with his loss and creating a fake story about traveling the ocean and finding Nemo in his head. Another really strong theory that just feels completely implied by the film. And just to clarify here, I'm not giving these theories bad summaries to make them look bad. This is how brief they're being. Like this next one isn't a metaphor, but it's just too funny not to include. Edna Mode was inspired by Randall Boggs' invisibility. And I thought, well, that sounds like a pretty complex theory that's gonna require a lot of evidence. And they gave 24 words, three of which are, you buying it? The theory is genuinely, when Randall went back in time, he came across Edna, Therefore, inspiring her costume for Violet with built-in invisibilt capabilities. Both those last two words are spelled wrong. You're buying it? Someone got paid to write that. <laughs> oh no. Like, it's literally, Randall has invisibility powers, Edna made an invisible suit. Like, that honestly takes the cake as the worst theory I've ever seen in my life. Anyway, back to the final metaphorical theory on this list, and I'm not joking with you here. Toy Story 3 is the story of the Holocaust. Yeah, literally. This is just a theory that's way too popular for its own good. That apparently, Andy leaving his toys behind symbolizes the allies to the Jewish people, because who didn't see that when they watched the film? Andy's attic is clearly a reference to Anne Frank. Yeah. And then there's the incinerator at the end, of course, referencing the concentration camps. I mean, firstly, no. And secondly, just why? Like, compare these to a theory about Elsa actually being related to Rapunzel and that's why she has her powers. Or Snoke actually being Darth Plagueis, Emperor Palpatine's former master. These completely change how you watch the films by revealing more about their lore and their characters and their backstories, which, in my opinion, make them so much better and is one of the reasons why I make theories. Do you know Seamus? Do you really? But I also want to clarify, I don't think metaphorical theories are bad, I just don't think they should be called theories. They're metaphors, and metaphors can be kind of cool, I have absolutely no problems with them, but they're not theories. So don't stop thinking of metaphors when watching films or reading books, if that's what you're into, go for it. But just remember, they're a very different thing to theory. Right now, the word theory just has the loosest definition, and I think we, as theorists, should we, try to define it. It's been it. four months since your last Pixar theory now, Seamus. Can you really claim that anymore? But it's not just any idea revolving around a story that wasn't discussed in the story itself should be considered a theory. A theory should be an attempt to explain something and should try to answer a question that a story left open or unanswered. And using evidence from the given material independent of the thing that needs to be explained should come to a solution that changes the way one views the story. In my opinion, this is the definition of a theory and we as theorists- Stop calling yourself a theorist! You literally Stop. don't even make no. big star theories anymore! Stop. You literally make videos no. critiquing theories! STOP! The truth is, there is a reason why. It's... that I can't do it. I can't do it. Not today.